All right, good morning and welcome everyone to this media webinar to discuss NOAA's and NASA's data for the 2022 global temperature record and other climate highlights from the year. I'm John Bateman with NOAA Communications and I will be facilitating today's briefing. NOAA and NASA are two keepers of the world's temperature data and independently produce a record of changes to Earth's surface temperatures based on historical observations over the ocean and land. Consistency between these two independent analyses and those analyses produced by other science agencies in other countries increases our confidence in the accuracy and assessment of the data, as well as the resulting conclusions. Today's 2022 Global Climate Briefing will feature a short introduction by NOAA's Chief Scientist, Dr. Sarah Kapnick, and NASA Administrator, Bill Nelson, followed by a presentation of the 2022 Global Climate Analysis. After the presentation, there will be a media question and answer session. And the audio from this webinar is also being streamed live by NASA at www.nasa.gov forward slash NASA live. After the opening remarks from Dr. Kapnick and Administrator Nelson, Dr. Russell Vos, the Chief of the Analysis and Synthesis Branch at NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information, or NCEI, will provide a summary of NOAA's 2022 global temperature and climate data. Following Dr. Vos will be Dr. Gavin Schmidt, Director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, who will summarize NASA's global temperature and climate data for 2022. After their presentations, Dr. Vos and Dr. Schmidt will be available for questions. Also, the slides from this presentation will be available for download. Just click the link in the download window at the bottom left of your screen. And we will now kick off this briefing with some words from NOAA's Chief Scientist, Dr. Sarah Katnick. Thank you, John. I'm excited to join our colleagues at NASA to highlight some of the ways 2022 stood out in the global climate record. I'm appreciative of this annual collaborative effort between our agencies. Producing analyses like this help us gain a collective understanding of how our climate is changing and how we can work to build a climate-ready nation to help our communities and economy better adapt to what lies ahead. Our agencies are able to provide this authoritative, global-scale climate data because of continuously collected and maintained observations. Weather, water, climate, and ocean observations gathered from instruments ranging from satellites orbiting Earth to sensors on ocean buoys are the backbone of NOAA's environmental science and stewardship mission. These are the best available science and observations regularly delivered to the American people through this important agency collaboration. I'll let our experts go into the specific climate trends for 2022. What I will say is that in addition to the climate trends that we saw last year, 2022 also produced costly climate-driven weather events here in the U.S. and worldwide. These frequent and increasingly costly extreme events have human consequences and pack an economic punch. The U.S. had its third costliest year for weather and climate-related disasters on record, exceeding $165 billion in damage. The reinsurance company Swiss Re estimated that natural and man-made disasters caused 268 billion of economic losses globally from January 1st to Jan December 1st of 2022, citing disasters such as winter storms in Europe, flooding in Australia and South Africa, and hailstorms in France. In the U.S., we have consistently had both the highest total count more than any other country each year and the largest diversity of different types of weather and climate extremes that lead to billion dollar disasters. This is generally due to a combination of two things. One, a high incidence of many extremes where both the exposure and vulnerability are high for producing damage. And two, climate change is enhancing certain types of extremes that may lead to billion dollar disasters. A warming planet, which we'll see evidence of from the statistics provided today, means we need to be prepared for the impacts of climate change that are happening here and now, like the more frequent and disruptive extreme events. This is where NOAA's climate science and services are more relevant than ever before, protecting lives, lifestyles, and livelihoods, and helping build a climate-ready nation. As we move to the future, NOAA will leverage its life cycle approach to how we equitably develop and deliver climate science data and tools, 
from data collection through sharing information with users to support the whole of government effort to address the climate crisis and promote economic development. We are doing this at the international scale with publicly available science and strong collaborations that help countries make science-based decisions and build climate-ready nations abroad as they shape their climate goals. I'm excited for NOAA and NASA to share this critical climate data with you today. I'm equally excited to see how businesses, communities, and individuals will use this information to enhance our understanding of the world around us and help prepare for a resilient future. In my capacity as chief scientist, I'm working to engage key sectors of our economy to promote the uptake of the incredible data that NOAA and the US government provides, with our regular climate statistics being a prime example. In my view, it is a key part of what a climate-ready nation means. When decision makers and leaders begin incorporating this key data into their planning, decisions, and forecasts. With that, I'll turn it back over to John for more on today's announcement. All right, thank you, Dr. Kapnick. Now we'll hear from NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Hey, everybody, thanks for joining us. If you go back to the year 1880, ever since, look at the hottest years on record. The year 2022 was the fifth hottest year, sharing that uh, alarming distinction with the year 2015. And when you look at nine of the past 10 years, they're the warmest years in the modern record since 1880. Now that's pretty alarming. And that's a trend that is growing in magnitude. And it's a trend that if we don't take it seriously and have some real action to mitigate it, there are gonna be deadly effects across this globe. Now at NASA, uh, we do science research. You think of us as a space agency, you think of us as an aeronautics agency, we are also a climate agency. And science leaves no room for doubt. And so what we're seeing is our warming climate, it's warning all of us. Forest fires are intensifying, hurricanes are getting stronger, droughts are wrecking havoc, sea levels are rising, extreme weather patterns threaten our well-being across this planet. And we need some bold action. And President Biden has sounded a call to action to tackle the climate crisis. And that requires activation at the federal, state, and local level and internationally. Now, NASA's value is in our extensive fleets of satellites and instruments on orbit, which provide detailed information of what's happening to the Earth. NASA has the most comprehensive data on the Earth as a system, and we share it with everybody. We share it around the world. This data has long been invaluable in determining changes to the Earth's system, the Earth's climate. Combined with the analysis and modeling that we do, we've understood why it's changing. Now, for example, 20 years ago, data from our satellites showed unexpectedly fast changes in the Earth's great ice sheets. EMIT, a mission that launched to the International Space Station last year, was supposed to be looking at how dust storms affect weather. But then all of a sudden we saw that it was proving to be a critical tool to measure emissions of methanes and to find the specific source on the planet where the methane was coming. And NASA is deepening our commitment to do our part because we're developing over the next decade, the Earth System Observatory. It's gonna be a system of about five major observatories that will be state-of-the-art data on climate change, 
severe weather, national hazards, wildfires, and global flu food production because we're going to measure very precisely what is happening to the land, the water, the ice, and the atmosphere and have a 3D composite of that information which we are going to share in a physical Earth Information Center as well as sharing that information virtually to everyone. Our partnerships across the government with NOAA, Department of Agriculture, EPA, USAID, USGS, just to name a few, strengthens these partnerships and that enables us to get this data into the hands of those who need it most, folks on the ground who use it to plant their crops, to plan their harvests, to map their resources, to provide for the common defense, to protect against disaster. So NASA designs, builds, and launches this uh, nation's fleet of weather satellites. We turn them over to NOAA. Uh, they operate them in addition to all the other assets, the satellites, and the ones that I told you that are coming in the future. And these spacecraft have delivered major improvements in global weather forecasting and undoubtedly have saved many lives. And not to mention NASA's efforts to make the commercial aviation industry greener through sustainable fuels, more efficient airliner design, taxi and takeoff technology and more. And we're just getting ready, for example, to fly the first all electric uh, experimental aircraft. And uh, we are uh, designing new wing design that will give us much more sustainable aviation. So today's announcement underscores what we already know to be true. If our leaders, not only here, but across the world, do not act on this scientific data, our ice sheets are gonna to continue to melt, our oceans will become more acidic, extreme weather will intensify. So I'm gonna ask you to let's uh, recommit our resolve to take action for our future. You're gonna hear from one of our uh, chief environmental and client uh, experts, Dr. Gavin Schmidt, director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And he's gonna be telling you uh, later on more about our findings and analysis. You have a good day and remember, this is a call for action. Thank you so much, Administrator Nelson. We will now begin our review of the 2022 Global Climate Analysis with Russell Vose. Russ. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks to Administrator Nelson for those opening remarks and Dr. Kapnick as well. So um, I'm here to tell you along with Gavin about some details with respect to global temperature in 2022. And I wanna get us all oriented before I kick off the details. Uh, Administrator Nelson in particular spoke about the fine satellites that are um, flown by NASA and NOAA. And Gavin and I are big fans of those. And in this case, the data we're talking about this morning are actually predominantly from surface-based observing systems. They're measurements of temperature from, of sea surface temperature over the ocean from ships and buoys and Argo floats and from near surface weather stations over the land. So again, we love the satellites, but this morning we're talking about surface observations. So on to the headlines. So for this year, we're starting with Noah and Gavin and I will alternate throughout this presentation. Um, NOAA ranked sixth for 2022. It was the sixth year, most warmest year on record in the in the NOAA record, which dates back to 1880. Um, 
if you really like the numbers, it was 0.86 Celsius or 1.55 degrees Fahrenheit above the average for the 20th century. So we were just slightly warmer than 2021. So having said the ranks, I like to steer away from the ranks as quickly as possible because ranks only tell you part of the story. It's great if it's college football or something and you're on the top of the pile. But what's really more important here is look at the last eight dots on this time series. This time series is of surface temperature going back to 1880. The last eight dots clearly stand above the rest of the record. The warmest eight years are the last eight years, and they really do stand apart. Um, if you look back a little further, meaning if I can direct your attention to the blue bars or the blue histogram, it's clear that each of the past four decades has been warmer than the decade that preceded it. And there's really been a steady, steady rise in temp temperature since at least the 1960s. And you can look further back. If you look at the first 20 years of the graph, say the last part of the 19th century, and you compare that to today. Well, current temperatures are about 1.1 degrees Celsius, warmer than they were in the late 19th century. And why is that important? Well, a lot of you have probably heard about the Paris Agreement, which is ideally trying to keep global warming to a level of 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, or sorry, Celsius. We're getting kind of close to that. Um, and we've been kind of flirting with that for some years now. So, you know, that's the status, that's where we are. A couple of other things I wanted to leave you with here on this plot, um, actually not on this plot, but it's worth noting, it's certainly warmer now than probably at least any time in the past 2000 years, probably much longer. And the rate of increase over the past 50 years has been faster than any time in the past two millennia. Um, as for next year, well, you never know. Um, barring a major volcanic eruption though, it's probably gonna be pretty warm. This almost 100% chance we'll be in the top 10 again. And with an El Nino potentially brewing, and Gavin could talk about that more a little later, we could be close to our record again. And of course, all this is consistent with uh, increasing concentrations of heat uh, trapping gases. Carbon dioxide levels were 417 parts per million in 2022. That's a 50% increase uh, over pre-industrial levels. And by the way, methane's up 150%, and nitrous oxide about 25%. Um, so you can kind of guess where the trend is likely headed. So, Gavin, on to you. Thank you very much, Russ. Um, uh, so, uh, the NASA record is, uh, is is put together slightly differently from the NOAA record in terms of methodology, interpolation, and uh, adjustments for uh, urban heat biases and, and, and the like. Uh, but you see that uh, uh, overall the trends are very, very similar. Um, uh, the, uh, the the specific ranking for the NASA data was uh, was fifth, uh, joint with uh, twenty seven uh, with uh, 2015. Um, and again, uh, the last nine years have been the uh, warmest nine years in the record. Uh, the last eight years have been clearly uh, above uh, one degree Celsius, uh, above the late 19th century. And uh, all of the things that uh, that Russ said uh, hold true for the uh, for the NASA record uh, as well. Uh, next. Oops. Sorry about that, we jumped to, all right, so this is a map of basically where it was warm and where it was cold in 2022, according to the NOAA analysis. Um, and you see a lot of reds here, or reddish hues. So what that's telling you is, well, it was warm over most land areas in 2022. It was actually the second warmest year on record in Europe. And if you focus on Western Europe, it was record warm in a lot of it, like the UK and France and Spain and Italy and. The jury's still out in Germany. I think they're finalizing some of their numbers, but record warm in a lot of uh, Western Europe. Asia also had its second warmest year on record. Um, and some of you probably remember uh, what had gone on in South Central Asia, like India and Pakistan, the really, really severe heat wave um, that was driven by the hot weather arriving unusually early in the year. So, um, that's most of the land surface was warm or above average. And by the way, when I talk about average, this picture is showing average relative to 1991 to 2020. So the last 30 years. But there were a few areas that were below average, parts of uh, Central North America, um, parts of Central Africa, Southern Australia, but not that much of the land surface. And sadly, that's actually been sort of a typical story. Most of the land surface has been warmer than average for quite some time. Over the oceans, um, again, most of the oceans, the Earth's global ocean has been above average, meaning red. But there is that big chunk of the tropical eastern Pacific that is blue. It's well below normal. 
This is being driven by uh, an event or a phenomenon called La Nina. So most of you are probably have heard of the term El Nino. Well, La Nina is the sister of El Nino. It's a, basically sea surface temperatures in the tropical eastern Pacific are below the long-term average. And what that tends to do is tug um, global temperatures down just a little bit. And Gavin has a nice slide showing um, some of those effects here in a couple of minutes. And speaking of Gavin, back to Gavin now. Yeah, this is our anomaly uh, map. It's, uh, it's with an earlier baseline, and so you're seeing more of the longer-term trends. Uh, but it's clear that the uh, the, the La Nina effect um, uh, in the tropical uh, eastern Pacific uh, was a very big part of what was going on last year. Uh, but it doesn't uh, negate all of the things that are happening uh, around the world. And so you can see uh, a very familiar pattern of uh, warming uh, more over the land than in the ocean, more in the north than in the south, uh, and most of of all in the uh, high Arctic latitudes, and we'll get to uh, some of those uh, issues uh, as well. Um, uh, there's uh, there's still a very clear hotspot in the Antarctic Peninsula uh, and uh, and around Western Antarctica. That's uh, that's of, of, of big concern uh, for all of us. And there's still a uh, a, a cool effect um, in the uh, in the in the southern oceans right close to uh, Antarctica. And we can discuss uh, why that might be an exception to uh, the rest of the world, uh, perhaps a little bit later in the questions. All right, so this is a kind of a depressing slide now that I think about it. I didn't mean for it to be that way. We put out this figure every year. It's significant events of um, the previous year, significant events of 2022, select events. This is not a comprehensive, all-inclusive figure. It's as much a compromise between what happened and where there's room on the map. Um, and what I'm gonna tell you about is in no particular order here, but the takeaway is there have been a lot of extreme events once again. Um, let's start with precipitation, rainfall. There was record-breaking rainfall in Pakistan in July and August, which caused floods that affected over 30 million people, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, likewise, there was heavy rain uh, that caused severe flooding over parts of Eastern Australia back in February and March, parts of Colombia in April, um, South Africa in April, Southern China in June, and we could go on. Uh, on the flip side, we also had warm and dry conditions affecting much of Europe during the Northern Hemisphere summer which exacerbated drought, fueled wildfires, and caused seasonal rivers to run at critically low levels. Um, similarly, you had warm and dry conditions that affected central and eastern China in summer, uh, with the Yangtze River actually hitting its lowest level on record in August. Much of southern South America was also drier than normal. And of course, there was drought in a big chunk of the western United States over much of the year. And I do acknowledge that like early this year, we've had some of the um, atmospheric rivers that have changed the story a bit in California, um, but that's a story for 2023, not 2022. Um, moving on now to the polar regions, um, average annual Arctic sea ice extent, sorry, Antarctic sea ice extent was actually the second lowest on record. So the melting continues. Um, if we go to the other pole, average annual Arctic sea ice extent was low once again, um, but actually was not one of the 10 lowest years. Uh, Gavin, again, will go into that shortly. Tropical cyclones. Overall, global tropical cyclone activity was near average. There were 88 named storms in 2022. Um, and that's, again, that's pretty near the average. If you look at the energy that was accumulated by these storms, that was actually the fourth, fourth lowest on record. So it was an interesting year in that respect. Average number of storms, but maybe a little less energy in those storms. But that's not really much comfort to those who had to fa face these 88 storms or some of the more notorious ones like Hurricane Ian in Florida um, earlier in the fall, which is now the third most costly U.S. hurricane on record, or say Typhoon Tinamnar in South Korea or Noru in Vietnam and Laos. Um, so certainly a heck of a lot of extremes again this year in a warming world. I'm not saying all these were caused by global warming, by the way, I'm not saying that, but certainly as the world warms up, you have more fuel for heat drives heat waves Warmer water can, or warmer air can hold more water, which can help fuel storms and so on. So it's a story that's likely to continue. Back to Gavin. Thank you. Um, uh, we often get uh, asked about the impacts of uh, the tropical Pacific variations on the global mean temperatures. And so uh, here we're trying to uh, give a sense of how important uh, the phase of ENSO um, is uh, in terms of uh, the global mean temperatures. Uh, so as we, uh, as we heard, 
uh, this year, uh, 2022, was uh, was a second consecutive year of uh, La Nina, uh, a cool uh, event in the uh, in the tropical Pacific. Um, and uh, by regressing out uh, the indices of uh, of Enso, uh, we can try and calculate what the impact is of the state of the uh, of, of, of the of the tropical Pacific. And so, so last year. Uh, we estimate that uh, uh, it did have a relatively significant effect, uh, you know, 0 0.06 Celsius uh, cooling uh, beyond what you would have seen in a neutral year. Um, and that contrasts with uh, years like 2016, uh, where you had like a 0.1 uh, addition to the to the warming because there was an El Nino uh, event. And so, so those differences uh, can make the difference between a year like 2020 and 2019. Um, uh, and if we uh, try and take out that of that uh, that effect, uh, you would have ended up with a with a situation uh, such that uh, 2022 uh, would have been the second warmest year on record uh, without the uh, La Nina. Occurring. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the warmest La Nina year uh, in the record. And if you look at the trends uh, for La Nina years, they're warming up at the same rate as the trends for El Nino years or for all years uh, put together. And so uh, these uh, tropical Pacific variations, uh, they're really like the noise on top of those long term trends. And the long term trends uh, are quite predictable and we understand why they're happening and it's obviously due to uh, our activities dominated by the increases of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases. Russ? Okay so we're actually jumping in the hot tub now here for a, for a minute. We're going below the surface. Uh, we're going to talk about something called ocean heat content and uh, 2022 sadly was also a record year for ocean heat content. Um, let me give you just a bit of background on what that is. Uh, ocean heat content is basically the total amount of warmth or heat energy stored by the oceans. It's essential for understanding and modeling global climate because the oceans actually store 90% of the excess heat in the Earth's system. Um, changes in ocean heat content are uh, determined using the measurements of ocean temperatures from various depths. Uh, in this case, this plot shows down to 2,000 meters. Uh, the measurements come from a variety of instruments ranging from expendable, what we call bathroom thermographs, to gliders, to bottles to instruments that are actually on marine mammals. I can't say there's a large fleet of dolphins doing this, but they are actually used to collect some of these data. Um, in 2022, the warmth of the world's oceans again hit a record. It's the highest since records began six decades ago. The four highest ocean heat content years have all been in the last four years. Just like temperature, there's been a steady upper trend since about 1970. And uh, as with temperature, each decade has been warmer than the decade that preceded it. But there's less variability from year to year in ocean heat content because the heat just keeps stacking up. There are, by the way, multiple estimates of ocean heat content. This plot shows two. One is um, from NOAA, um, and the number for 2022 exceeds the number of 2021 by, I believe, about nine zettajoules, which is a heck of a big number, heck of a big unit of energy. The NASA ECHO record, um, that's ECCO, is consistent with the NOAA record in showing the ongoing increase in record levels of ocean heat content. Um, just to close on this slide, you know, because changes in ocean systems occur over centuries, the oceans haven't warmed yet as much as the atmosphere, even though they've absorbed again 90% of the excess heat since say the mid 1950s. If it wasn't for the large storage capacity of the oceans, the atmosphere actually would have warmed a lot more already. And the implications to this, warm ocean temperatures provide heat for tropical cyclones, they affect the frequency and intensity of marine heat waves um, and ocean water when it's warm, it expands slightly, which helps drive the increase in global sea level. Back to Gavin. Uh, we mentioned earlier on the uh, the increasing uh, heat in the Arctic, where the the global warming signal is uh, is the strongest. Um, uh, depending a little bit on uh, where you draw the boundary for the Arctic, uh, the, the the Arctic is warming uh, between three and a half and four times uh, as fast as the global mean, um, and it's uh, and it's seeing that warmth in uh, in all seasons. Uh, the change in the sea ice, as you can see here, was showing uh, both the March and September uh, Arctic sea ice extent changes. Uh, we've, we've had about a 10% decrease uh, in the maximum uh, Arctic sea 
ice in March, uh, but more like a 40% decrease uh, in uh, in September. Uh, there's a lot of interannual variability, and in fact, the interannual variability in the uh, in the summer uh, sea ice is increasing because it, as it as it as it becomes less uh, and is more sensitive to uh, to the weather. Uh, but uh, these long-term trends are uh, fully consistent with what we're expecting from climate models. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, that we mentioned uh, earlier is that the records that we've been talking about are surface-based, uh, so they're, they're ground-based measurements of, uh, of various sorts. Uh, but we do have uh, other ways of looking at those temperatures uh, through uh, reanalysis systems, which are a combination of uh, in-situ measurements, remote-sensed measurements, and a climate model. Uh, and what you can see in the top row there is that the trend since 1979 uh, in the reanalysis data and in the surface data um, are very consistent. There are differences in um, uh, uh, in resolution. Uh, the, uh, the the ERA five uh, reanalysis has got higher resolution than uh, than we put together for the surface uh, data. Uh, but you can see that the patterns of change are very very consistent. Now these are not totally independent uh, data sets, uh, but but they are uh, consistent data sets. Now, the AIRS instrument uh, is a totally independent data set uh, that measures uh, ground temperatures in the IR, and that has a record uh, that is now uh, almost 20 years long. It, it in fact, is 20 years long, um, and, uh, and shows slightly uh, different um, uh, patterns. Uh, overall patterns are very similar. Uh, overall trends are very similar within the uncertainties of each measurement. Um, and so that's a totally independent test uh, for the modern period of the ground-based measurements that we're talking about now. And so we do have uh, independent means uh, to, to demonstrate that these patterns uh, are not just uh, are not just noise, they're not just uh, urban heat uh, island effects and the like, uh, but they are in fact reflective of the changing climate and the, uh, uh, and the changing temperatures uh, that go along with that. Next. All right, we are going to close with two quick slides here. The one, the first one here is just sort of a public service announcement. Um, NOAA has used a version of a data set, NOAA Global Temp version 5, for several years now. And we have a new one that's going to be coming online in 2023. Uh, the map that you see here on the screen now depicts the anomalies for 2022 in the new data set. And there are a couple of takeaway messages here. Um, the main one is that we now have full coverage of all land and ocean areas, including the poles. Um, so this map shows you just like the NASA map did that the Arctic was clearly quite a bit above normal in 2022, as was a good bit of the Antarctic, which is a little bit more difficult to catch. And uh, one of the ways we were able to achieve this coverage is by using in part the same basic methods we've used in the past but um, we did go out and retrieve a lot of additional data for the Arctic Ocean um, from ships and buoys and in particular ice buoys that are managed by the International Arctic Buoy Program. So that gives us some ability to make a better estimate of what's going on in the Arctic. We didn't feel comfortable doing that in the past. We, we have this now, and again, this will be what we start to use um, with our 2023 reports at NOAA. And last is a message that Despite all that good work, it doesn't matter too much. This plot is showing you the um, records from four of the major global surface temperature um, initiatives, if you will. And I'm not going to even tell you what color each line is, because you can probably see that they all tend to agree really closely, despite they have different methodologies, somewhat different input data sets, um, a lot of heck of a, a heck of a lot of good work to do things in slightly different ways to, in the end, get almost exactly the same answer. And in fact, you have to go back to the mid to late 19th century where we started to have somewhat differences of opinion, which isn't surprising because the amount of observations you have back then are really sparse and it's really hard to get them right. But the point is we all tell basically the same story while our ranks might differ a little bit from year to year, the long-term trend is up. We wish we could tell a different story, but that's not what we get paid to do. We get paid to tell you what the numbers are. So on that note, I will close and pass the microphone back to John Jones Bateman. All right. Thanks so much, both Gavin and Russ, for that. Uh, we are going to now open the briefing to questions from the media. 
To ask a question, please find the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Type in your name, affiliation, your question, and the specific expert you would like to answer it if possible. And as a reminder, we have Dr. Vose and Dr. Schmidt available to take your questions. Now guys, our first question is for either one of you or both of you. Um, why are the NOAA and NASA rankings for 2022 slightly different? Um, I, can, I can answer that. I, I, one of the things that, uh, that you saw that was different, uh, sorry, my computer suddenly decides to uh, tell me that it's going to update all of my uh, software. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things that, that is different uh, in the, uh, the NOAA and the NASA records uh, up until this year was the interpolation through to the Arctic. Um, uh, the, the NASA record uh, has been uh, interpolating uh, over areas of uh, data sparsity uh, for a while because it's been important uh, to include uh, uh, the, uh, the, the exceptional warming in the Arctic. And so that, that changes, uh, depending on what's happening in the Arctic from one year to another, that changes uh, the, uh, the rankings that you would get. Uh, none of these things are really statistically significant. Uh, so the difference between fifth and sixth uh, in our ranking um, is uh, on the order of a hundredth of a degree Celsius. That's not a robust change. So a change in methodology, a change in input data uh, could easily flip that either way. And so uh, we don't uh, try and we try not to make too much um, of the, the, the specific rankings. Uh, the, the key thing is the long-term trends and they're very uh, consistent from one record to another. Wonderful. And if you have nothing to add, Russ, I'll go and ask the next question. Um, this is from Seth Borenstein from the Associated Press, and this is from both Gav, uh, for both Gavin or Russ. Uh, when do you expect the world to hit the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark? Russ said we're flirting with it. And when would you say the world's average uh, will be at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial as opposed to one single year? Thank you. I'll go ahead and take a first stab at it since um, Seth said I was flirting with it. The, uh, there's, this is actually a slightly more complicated question because there is like the question of when does an individual year hit 1.5 degrees Celsius? And then there's the issue of like, when does the average, like let's say a 10 or 20 year average hit 1.5 degrees Celsius? And those are two different things. There's actually probably, I don't know, 50% 50, 50, 50 chance that we have one year in the 2020s that maybe jumps above 1.5. That's, I think, the World Meteorological Organization has already stated something to that effect. If you look at the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, um, sixth assessment report, which focuses more on averages for, um, you know, multi-year periods, I think it projected that we'd hit 1.5 degrees of Celsius of warming in the late 2030s or 2040s and sort of a sustained average. So those are two different answers to your question, Seth, but long story short, we might hit it you know, for any given year sooner than we will hit it on an average basis. Uh, yeah, so so that's obviously uh, that's obviously true. Uh, the current rate of warming is just over 0.2 degrees Celsius uh, per decade, uh, and so if you think that we're at 1.1 now, which we do, 1.1 to 1.2, uh, effectively we have two decades before uh, at, uh, at a sustained, continued rate of warming, uh, we would uh, we would be uh, uh, we would be at 1.5 and above uh, subsequently. Uh, uh, Rust is right. Uh, the first year uh, with uh, 1.5 anomaly will be um, a, an, an El Nino year, uh, probably in the early 2030s. Okay, thanks to you both. Uh, we now have another question from Akash Nagankir. Uh, this is for either one of you. Will the actions we take today be enough to forestall the direct impact of climate change or is it too little, too late? I mean, I can address that. Um, so uh, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. You know, our uh, our attributions of the climate changes that we've seen right now suggest that all of the trends that we're seeing are effectively uh, due to human activities, uh, carbon dioxide being the number one cause, but also methane, uh, nitrous oxides, black carbon, uh, deforestation, like um, those, uh, uh, that attribution, that understanding um, also tells us that future warming is a function of future 
premature emissions uh, of carbon dioxide. And so we, as a society, collectively, we still have agency. So uh, what we are going to do in the future is going to determine what happens in the future. Uh, and so uh, if we continue to emit at the rate that we are emitting right now, uh, then uh, we are going to continue to warm and we would be, uh, you know, the, pretty much rushing past uh, 1.5. Uh, if we uh, collectively uh, reduce emissions uh, quite quickly, then we can avoid uh, the uh, the higher temperatures. I mean, the, the, we're not uh, we're not guaranteed to continue on a linear trend. Uh, that uh, that trend is really very much a function of uh, what we decide to do with with respect to emissions. Uh, pledges that countries have made uh, through the Paris Agreement uh, suggest uh, that efforts are being made uh, sufficiently globally to uh, to not exceed two and a half or three degrees Celsius uh, by the end of the century. Uh, but obviously that's, uh, that's still a lot more warmer than, uh, uh, than we are seeing right now and what I think <laughs> uh, we, we, we should be comfortable with. Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, efforts will, this is obviously my personal opinion, I think efforts will um, increase and, uh, uh, and we, may, uh, we may avoid the worst uh, projections. Uh, but it's never going to be too late uh, to make better decisions. Uh, at any point uh, in the future, uh, we can decide to do something that will reduce the emissions uh, and reduce the temperatures uh, in the future. And so uh, this is not um, uh, a one and done deal. Uh, this is a continued sustained issue uh, that will continue and be sustained for, for the rest of this century. Thank you so much, Dr. Schmidt. All right, next question for either one of you. This is from Rebecca Hersher from NPR. Uh, Gavin teased something about heat in the Southern Ocean. Can you say more about that? Thanks. Yes, I can. So, so one of the interesting um, discrepancies between model predictions and what's been happening in these records uh, is that the, uh, the, the Southern Ocean uh, warms pretty consistently in model uh, predictions of, of the historical period. Um, and, uh, and that hasn't happened. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that, is, that is not included uh, in many of those models uh, is the impacts of uh, the anomalous freshwater that's coming from the Antarctic continent. So Antarctica is losing about 150 gigatons uh, per year uh, of, uh, uh, of, of mass from its ice sheets uh, a, and as much again from the floating ice shelves. Uh, that fresh water is affecting uh, the stratification and mixing in the Southern Ocean. And we think that that is likely to have been causing a local cooling, uh, uh, despite the fact that the, that the ice as a whole is melting uh, because uh, warm water from below is, is, is actually coming in and melting those ice sheets. Uh, and so we are looking uh, at improving the modeling on this and, uh, and further uh, investigating the, uh, the causes uh, of that, that particular anomaly, uh, which is both scientifically interesting, but also uh, of, of, of practical significance because of its uh, implications for uh, sea level rise, uh, both through uh, heat uh, thermal expansion of the ocean uh, and through the addition of ice uh, into the uh, into the ocean. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next question from Dinah Pulver. One of you mentioned volcanoes. I think that might have been you, Russ. Um, could either of you, or perhaps Russ, since I believe you're the one who mentioned it, uh, could you discuss briefly any impact seen from the Hunga Tonga eruption? Did it have a bearing on the global temperature last year? Yeah, I'll take the first stab, then Gavin can like actually add content to it. The um, that eruption was remarkable. It injected a lot of water vapor into the stratosphere. I mean, a lot of water vapor, um, and that could, in theory, have a small positive impact, or could meaning it could increase global temperatures a little bit. Um, that's my understanding of it. Gavin, do you have something more you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, so uh, so at the AGU meeting uh, in December, there was uh, there were a couple of sessions uh, specifically about the Hunga Tonga eruption. Um, absolutely fascinating science. Uh, so you know, I think uh, uh, people should be covering that as a as a as a science story in and of itself. Um, the plume reached fifty six kilometers, uh, which is absolutely uh, massive. But unlike uh, most of the previous 
uh, volcanoes that we have uh, examined over the 20th century, um, it didn't put very much sulfate, sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. So if you, um, if you recall uh, Mount Pinatubo in 1991 or El Chichon in 1982, uh, they put large amounts of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, which became uh, sulfate aerosols, which, had, uh, which are reflective and so had a, had a very dramatic cooling uh, impact on the, uh, on the surface temperatures, uh, which you could see in one of the earlier slides if you were, uh, if you were paying attention. Um, but Hunga Tonga did not put very much sulfate uh, in the uh, in the atmosphere at all, um, uh, and uh, and what it did put in was was processed very quickly. Uh, and so this the the big the big effort the big impact was uh, was in self, uh, stratospheric water vapor, and it seems to have added about ten percent to the total burden of, uh, of stratospheric water vapor just from that one eruption. Um, and water vapor doesn't, uh, it, it kind of, it drifts around uh, a lot, has a, it has quite a long lifetime in the, um, uh, in the stratosphere. And so uh, we'll, be, we'll be tagging uh, that, that anomaly uh, for a while, but uh, it in and of itself, uh, while stratospheric water vapor is a, is a contributor to, um, uh, to, to global warming, it's not large enough uh, to really be seen in the uh, in the, in the noise of the of, of the interannual variability. All right, thank you so much, um, if, uh, Russ. If you're able to, we have a question referencing one of the slides. Are you able to go back to slide seven by chance? Yes. And while you do that, I will mention. Uh, the question. It is from uh, Isao Matsunami from Ku, uh, Kunichi, which is a daily newspaper in Japan. Uh, the question is on page seven of the slide, uh, what do you mean by the influence of La Nina on average temperature? Do you mean the actual energy flow into La Nina from surrounding areas or the mathematical impact on the averaging due to the large size of the La Nina area? Uh, so uh, it's a little bit of both. So obviously, when you have a La Nina, you have areas of the uh, of the world that are cooler, and so that goes into the averages for any particular one year. Uh, but the uh, uh, but the impact of uh, the tropical Pacific actually has uh, has a has a broader impact. It, it changes the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. It changes the cloud distribution. That changes the distribution of heat um, elsewhere, uh, not just in the tropical Pacific. And that's why it has uh, such a wide wide um, impact. And so when we're saying uh, the, end, the the La Nina impact on global temperature, you're including both of those effects. So both the, the local changes in, in SST, but also the far field changes uh, in, in water vapor and radiation that are also affecting the temperatures elsewhere. Wonderful. And, and actually, there was a, a second part to that question. Uh, a new global analysis version 5.1 is available in GeoTIFF net CDF format? Yes or no? Nets, I believe Nets CDF. I don't believe we have it in GeoTIFF, and they're actually not publicly available yet. We will release those in February. So the slides I had in this presentation were just sort of a teaser to give people a heads up that this time next year we'll be using a different product. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Russ. Uh, next question we have from Eric Nyler from the Wall Street Journal. It's about ocean heat content. Um, he asked, can you quanti uh, quantify the amount of ocean heat, such as what is nine zeta joules equal to? All right, this, this is always a, it's a great question. It's a strange unit, isn't it? And I'll just relay a couple of analogies that I've heard used in the past to like give a sense of the magnitude of this. You know, one is uh, like total energy consumption around the world is about a half a zeta joule annually. So, you know, there's one metric. Another one that's far more grim is something like, I think a zeta joule is a, equivalent to five Hiroshima bombs going off every second or something like that. It's a massive amount of energy. That's the takeaway message. Yeah, it's very big. Yeah, I agree. Yes, it sounds like it. Thank you guys both. Um, we had another question. It was a region specific question, if you're able to um, answer that. And if not, you can, um, the, 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 the media person asking this question can reach out to me. It's from Paola Whiskey from the Dario Libre uh, uh, from the Dominican Republic, um, asking what they can expect for the Caribbean in terms of extreme events coming up in 2023. 
well, I'll take your first quick stab at it. Um, it, you know, it's a great question. I mean, if I was living in the Caribbean, I would really love to have an answer to that question. Um, but I can't say anything more now than probably, you know, what you usually expect in a climatological sense. You know, you're always going to run the risk of tropical cyclones. Um, and that's probably your bigger, biggest risk. But um, I don't think that it would be possible to like make a statement for what's going to go on in the Caribbean this year beyond that. Thank you, Russ. Um, next question. Uh, let me see here. From Greg Harmon, Deceleration News. Uh, again, uh, either one of you. Uh, can you qu uh, quantify how much La Nina was dragging down global temperatures in 2022 and what force that will bring as uh, El Nino shifts into gear later this year, given that all weather systems have imprints for all of these additional humor, uh, given that all weather systems have imprinted uh, on, of all this additional human generated heat, is it useful for journalists to stop asking about the impact of our activities on any particular weather event? Uh, or is it time to retire that question? And actually, I'm sorry, right after that, <laughs> He said, let me clean this up a bit. So let me re-ask that if, if you need to. I, I, uh, I, yeah. Or do you think, you, did you guys get it? I, 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 can, I can read both. So I'll, okay. I'll, just, uh, I'll just respond. Um, actually, so the slide up here uh, gives you the answer to that. So uh, La Nina dragged down the temperature, if you like, uh, by, uh, by about 0 0.06 uh, degrees Celsius, about 0 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit uh, this year. Um, we are in a triple dip La Nina situation. So going into 2023, uh, we have a slightly milder La Nina uh, event uh, happening uh, that will continue to drag it down, but it won't drag it down as much as last year. And so we anticipate that 2023 will be a warmer year. Um, whether at the end of, at the end of 23, uh, we start moving into an El Nino situation is unknown at this point. I don't think we have uh, good predictions uh, that far out. Uh, but should such a thing happen, uh, then uh, we would anticipate that the following year, so that would be 2024, uh, would be uh, a contender for the warmest year on record. Um, the next El Nino, whether, whether it happens at the end of this year or in subsequent years, uh, that will that will trigger uh, almost certainly a new a, a new record. We can still get a record without uh, an El Nino event. Even a neutral event uh, can can produce a record in these temperatures, and you can see that uh, happening if you if you look uh, uh, if you look historically. Um, now, whether uh, the impacts of global warming on weather extremes is uh, is, is becoming an, an interesting question, I, I don't I don't think so. I think it's uh, becoming a uh, more pertinent question. Uh, but the, the question that should be asked is not whether any of these extreme events are being caused by global warming, uh, but whether these things are being, uh, to what extent they're being made more intense or more frequent uh, by global warming. Um, and that uh, for a whole class of events now, uh, if it's a heat wave, the answer is yes, it's being made uh, both more intense and more frequent uh, by global warming. For intense precipitation, uh, the same thing, uh, but, for, uh, but for, for droughts, tornadoes, um, derechos, uh, you know, the jury is still out uh, on, uh, on what the direct uh, contribution is from, uh, from, from global warming. Uh, but it isn't. It is still an interesting question, and I think it's a question uh, that, as we try and kind of add up the, the the costs and the damages associated with climate change, uh, actually becomes a very pertinent question. All right, thank you, Gavin. Uh, I just want to remind folks we have about five more minutes left of this press briefing, um, and we do have another question for you. Uh, this one is from uh, Manuel Mazanti from uh, Exploration. Especial, I, pardon me if I uh, uh, mangled that pronunciation. If you would uh, have to name one, which industry is the one that contributes the most to global warming in your opinion? Uh, it's very easy. It's uh, power generation. It's the burning of fossil fuels for the generation of electricity, followed by the transportation sector, uh, the burning of fossil fuels in um, cars, trucks, automobiles and the like. All right. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, this next one is from Mara uh, Hoplamazian uh, from New Hampshire Public Radio. How did snowfall look throughout 2022 compared to past years? 
Uh, how do you see climate change affecting snowfall given the rise in temperatures and warmer air holding more water? So I can probably take a quick one at this um, 2022. It's basically Northern Hemisphere snow cover. There's not much in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Northern Hemisphere snow cover for 2022 was near average. Um, as for how climate change is going to affect snowfall, that's a somewhat more complicated question. Um, the, you know, obviously if it gets warmer, you might expect there to be fewer snow events and more rain events, but that gets, you know, that depends upon where you are and you're still going to have major snow events, you know, because you still have winter. Um, the, there's some, if you're talking about the Northeast and I'm trying to like jog my memory here, there's some indication that heavy snowfalls have been a little more frequent in the Northeast, um, which is consistent with like increasing temperatures in the Western Atlantic and Arctic air outbreaks uh, from polar vortex disruptions. But um, again, the I'm, I'm, I'm speculating since this is New Hampshire Public Radio, that's why I'm giving you that answer. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's it really depends upon where you are. Yeah, I, I, let me let me very briefly add to that. Uh, if you look at trends in snow cover, uh, we're seeing very strong trends in spring and summer. So so we're we're seeing less and less um, lingering snow uh, in the in the higher latitudes. Uh, the winter snow cover trends are noisy, but but actually quite steady. Um, uh, but then when you have uh, snowfalls, like we saw, uh, we, we saw very large uh, lake effect snowfalls in, uh, in Buffalo um, and surrounding areas uh, very recently. Uh, part of that is that uh, the Great Lakes are not freezing up as early as they used to. And so there's more moisture for lake effect snow. And so when you have an Arctic climate blast, you're seeing uh, an increase in snowfalls. Uh, so that may be uh, particularly in the early part of the uh, uh, of, of the winter and, and again perhaps in the later part of the, the winter, early spring, uh, you would anticipate uh, that in some of those regions you will be getting more and more snow uh, or, or heavier snow. Uh, but it is a uh, it is a complicated picture. Uh, we have worked on that that is that we're about to submit. Um, uh, but it is uh, it, it is a complicated picture. All right, thanks to both of you. Uh, we have one more question as we start wrapping up this press briefing. This one is from uh, Dave Burns from Courthouse News. Uh, this is for either one of you guys. Uh, Mr. Schmidt talked about the need to exert collective agency to alter our climate trajectory course, but the 2017 Carbon Majors Report uh, attributed 71% of global industrial emissions to just 100 companies. If that report is accurate, at what point does NASA or NOAA say the problem is capitalism? Um, well, I, I, I think it's unlikely that uh, NOAA or NASA will uh, will blame capitalism. Uh, that's kind of a little bit out of their wheelhouse. Um, I, I think, I mean, personally speaking, I, I think that that's somewhat of a misleading statistic. Uh, the companies that they're including there are the oil companies uh, and the coal, coal companies, but all those products are being used by people and by industries and by uh, cities and, and, and other infrastructure. Um, it's not that, you know, you know, it, it isn't as if we could just turn around and say, ExxonMobil, stop, stop producing fossil fuels, and then we'd solve the problem. Uh, what we need to be doing, my personal opinion, right, um, is, uh, is moving away from fossil fuels. Um, but I don't think that, uh, that just like kind of naming and shaming the fossil fuel companies um, does really very much to help us on that track. All right, thank you guys. Uh, and I believe that is the last of our questions for today. Um, I wanna thank both of you uh, and everyone else who participated in this, the presenters, participants for joining us today. Uh, I just wanna remind everyone though that a recording of this media briefing will be available later, hopefully later this afternoon. Uh, it will be on the online media advisory on NOAA.gov as well as on NOAA Satellite's YouTube channel. Uh, if anyone from the media also has any additional questions or informational needs, you can feel free to reach out to me, John Bateman, or John Leslie, my uh, co uh, colleague at NOAA Satellites. A and our email address is nesdis.pa at noaa.gov. That is N-E-S-D-I-S dot P-A at N-O-A-A dot G-O-V. And again, that contact information is also available in the media advisory. We really appreciate all of you joining us today.
Thank you.